Hi, everybody. I'm Cynthia Garrett, and welcome to the sessions. Yep. And as you know, because you've been with us for the last month, we are or so, uh, these are virtual sessions. These are kind of special. These are sessions that are uh, necessary for a special time in our world. And uh, I like to call this pandemic mania. Um, joining, joining me as always, you're, you're going to be now watching on screen as I introduce a really incredible guest. And she is a young woman that I met actually through Darren Wilson when we both were guests on a Darren Wilson episode of Adventures with God or Sessions with God. And um, I was just impacted by her and her journey. And you're gonna get that as you watch. But uh, Rebecca Bender is no stranger to overcoming life's obstacles. And you know, we've been talking a lot about victory on this season of the sessions in celebration of my new book, I Choose Victory. Well, Rebecca has chosen victory in so many ways and in the face of so many odds. She is a survivor of sex trafficking. She is a powerful author. She's a powerful speaker. She's also a law enforcement consultant and CEO of Elevate Academy, which is a school for victims of sex trafficking. I, I, I just cannot wait to talk about the restoration in her life. But you know, we will start at the beginning with her journey so that you really get to know the journey of this incredible woman of God. Um, Rebecca even managed to squeeze in getting her master's at seminary school recently, and she has four beautiful daughters. And um, as we dive in, I just want all of you to welcome Rebecca Bender. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's fun to be here. I'm so excited we finally got to do this. Um, and below us, you guys, you, you can see, or I don't know how she is on your screen. She might be in the same row as we are. But anyway, Christina Reynolds, who's um, a regular, she's our regular musical leader here on the show and also a great, a great co-host and sidekick and a great friend and sister in Christ. So you guys, Rebecca, since I met you, um, your story is just so powerful. I mean, and I, and I know that people probably tell you this all over the world and everywhere you go, but um, you're inspirational, you know? And, and, and I, I, I get what it's like to choose victory in the face of a lot of odds. So I just would love to start at the very beginning. Um, and I mean, really the beginning. How did you grow up? Because I'm always curious how our childhood plays a part in the choices and decisions we make in our life. Sometimes it yeah. does, sometimes it doesn't. So true, and so good. And I, thanks for saying that. I mean, honestly, I, I would say when, when we wanted to start kind of sharing the story of what God had done, I remember praying and asking the Lord, like, I don't know, you know, if you want, you know, it's a big testimony and it's, it's, it, when you go out, when it comes out, you, there's no going back. It's out there. And, um, I remember the Lord saying, this isn't your story. This is my story and I will have it heard. And I just, I'm always reminded when someone's like, it's so inspiring. And I'm thinking, well, cause it's Jesus. It's only him. This is the only way that I found freedom. And so to literally when people say to him, be the honor and glory, like literally, you know, I, sometimes I, I, I'm just so in awe of all that he can do and will continue to do. And so cool. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, my story, I grew up in a real small town in Southern Oregon. It's the same town that I live in today. I moved back here when I was finally able to escape, but I grew up in a small farm town. So I grew up skipping rocks on the river, picking tomatoes out of the garden as a little girl. Um, my grandma would take me to vacation Bible school and, and Sunday school, but my parents weren't really believers living for the Lord. Um, I was an only child, so just kind of grew up. My dad was a, a, worked at the local lumber mill, just small town, blue collar family, really nothing, nothing big or special at all. And when my parents, when I was nine, my parents divorced. It was a very ugly divorce. Um, my dad started drinking a lot throwing things against the wall. My mom was suddenly a single mom trying to make ends meet, went through, um, you know, had a boyfriend that wasn't a very good guy to her. And thankfully she didn't stay with him long. But during that time, nine to 12 were really formative years. And unfortunately I had a lot of um, situations in that time that made me created a lot of vulnerabilities that are, like you said, really the root of a lot of, of the issues we saw later on. But 
a lot of feelings of being unwanted, unimportant. Um, my dad would forget to pick me up sometimes for visitation because of his alcoholism. He'd pick me up, we'd drive to the bar and I'd be left in the car while he went in. So just little things that, that lies that formed root in my heart in those moments of being unseen, unwanted, um, unimportant. And as I grew into um, high school, my mom remarried a great man. She got a great job and kind of things became normal for me again. And I was an active athlete and student and very gregarious young teenage girl. But because of those vulnerabilities, um, I definitely also became kind of a yes girl and a party girl and be happy to, after the football game, jump in the back of a pickup truck and go to the bonfire with beer, you know, it's kind of a normal small town kid. Yeah. I got to tell you, part of the reason why I wanted to really start and 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 look at your childhood is because, I, you know, you had a fairly normal childhood, right? And I think that when we talk about sex trafficking, and for those of you watching, Rebecca's story is a powerful story of overcoming sexual abuse, you know, in one of its forms, right, through trafficking. And I think oftentimes people think, well, you know, there must be a bad childhood. These girls must end up here, you know, because their parents hated them or, and it's, it's none of that. You know, I find your story to, to be really one in which any girl could be seduced, you know, by her desire to be loved, you know? Yeah. So could you kind of um, speak about in your journey when you met the guy that would be the, responsible for changing your entire life? Yeah, and I think you're right. Most people, and the reality is, is that vulnerabilities put young women hugely at risk for exploitation. We do see that issues of substance abuse, poverty, race, gender, all impact the vulnerabilities of being trafficked. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's the only group that's targeted. Um, but, but it does put people higher at risk. And so when we're wanting to get involved in the issue in the fight against trafficking, I think it's really important to identify who the most vulnerable people are in your community because if you can identify them i promise you traffickers are too and they're going to go after them and offer them all the things that they need whether it's love or attention or belonging or community or money um and that's how the lure happens it's it's very very rarely stranger danger um i think most people envision kidnapping i know i did i was a i grew up as an 80s kid i was taught you know look out for the white minivan and the guy that offered you a puppy and a candy and and so when my situation wasn't mirroring that i thought well i must not be being trafficked i must i love my boyfriend we're gonna get married um he's inviting me to move in with him and moving away secluding me from family and friends although i didn't realize that was a a red flag in the beginning i believed the con that he was running on me i believed that he had a job that was relocating him I did not realize as a young girl that this man was a con artist and he was pretending to be what I desperately wanted in order to kind of get me in his, in his clutches. And then I was this young in love girl that I didn't see some of the writing on the wall because it wasn't mirroring a kidnapping. And I think we always thought trafficking looked like that. And so I thought, well, that must not be what's happening to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, listen, I, I think so often that as the church, we don't talk about issues enough, like relevant day-to-day -day issues, relevant day-to-day -day feelings and struggles and challenges that we're, we're all having and that we have in the world today. And so things like this, they, they grow and they get worse, but I'm so proud of the church for really being a real champion of this cause of of sex trafficking. And, you know, right now, uh, Benjamin Nolo with Exodus Crime Ministries, and I think you may have met Benji. Oh, I'm wow. on the board. Yeah. Okay. I'm on the Exodus Crime board. I love Benji. Good friend. Yes. Good. He's a very good friend of ours as well. And I, I, man, I tell you, I try to do my part by making sure his films are played everywhere, even yeah. on the channel here on TVN. And, 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 you know, he's really, they're launching this, they have launched this massive campaign against Pornhub, mm -hmm. you know, at, which is owned and controlled by Mind Geeks, I believe it is. So, yes. you know, and Pornhub, I like to describe as the YouTube for 
pornography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm often engaged, I find it very interesting, by men who want to argue about my position, which is that, you know, you got, we need to abolish legalized porn because legalized porn is on the same spectrum as the, as child sex trafficking. And it's like, how do you get from here to here? Well, you get from here to here by allowing here to exist. And there is just the imagination once it's unchecked by this existing, you know, it's the scripture that says a little bit of yeast makes the whole batch of dough rise, I, I believe. Um, but so I'd love to know your thoughts just on that. You know, do, do you think that, you know, it is the little bit of sexual perversion or sexual sin that we allow in the world, that we allow in our lives, that we allow anywhere in the systems that we live in that really contribute to girls like you getting just picked off and abused and trafficked. Yeah, I mean, hi, I mean, hypersexuality is so rampant in, in our culture nowadays in general that I think it's important that we are more aware of how those type of, the type of peer pressure, so to speak, in regards of hypersexual culture really influences us. I think when we think of peer pressure, we only imagine our kids' friends or our peers and our circle of influence, and we're not realizing the peer pressure of culture and what's normal, what's what's acceptable. Um, and it's it's important that we're at least aware so we know how to raise up our children differently. When we talk about trafficking, a lot of people want to you know talk about what makes young women vulnerable. And I always want to rephrase the question and say, it's not just so much about making sure that we're, we're assisting people that are vulnerable, but it, this is a boy's issue because the number one buyer in the world is men. And so like, how are we raising our young men in a really hypersexual culture to be defenders and protectors of women and children? It's so true, you know? So let's go back to the time. So now you meet this guy and he seems like the answer to a prayer at a time in your life, um, you were in college. And, and, and I, you know, I can put myself in your shoes and really understand what it feels like to be a young mom and to feel you know, a bit overwhelmed and a bit like great about a Prince Charming riding in on a white horse. Because I think, I always say, you know, if I had it to do all over again, I would never let my nieces or my or my daughters, which I have no daughters, you know, but if I had daughters that I birthed biologically um, and not just all the spiritual daughters I have, I wouldn't raise them on fairy tales because I was really always looking for Prince Charming on that white horse to come in and save the day. And I just think it's a normal part of how we're conditioned as young women in the society that we live in. So when he rode in, did he, were there any warning flags? Cause I know in my own testimony, you know, the guy that sort of drugged me to hell and back, you know, through abuse and everything else. And I do mean a literal hell, a confrontation with Satan and hell. Um, there were warning signs initially, but I didn't pay attention to them. Yeah. Did you have any warning signs? Yeah, there were lots of red flags now that we're, you know, a healthy adult being able to look back and, and put the pieces together. And when I told my daughter, what had happened to us for the first time she was, I think she was about 12. And I wanted to let her know before, you know, it came out in the news or something, because decided to, to follow the call and, and tell my story. And I remember her saying, crying, but I remember her saying like, now it all makes sense, right? And so even in the midst of the trafficking, when I tried to keep her as secluded as possible, um, even she as a little girl saw lots of little things but it's like the dots never connected until you finally had words to what you were going through. For a long time, I just thought I was in domestic violence. I thought, you know, my, my quote unquote boyfriend lured me to move to Vegas. He told me his job was relocating him. So I went with him. When I got there, he took my daughter and forced me into prostitution the day that I arrived. Um, How old was your daughter? She was not even a year yet. Oh so, my gosh. and my baby. And part of me thought, you kind of justifying it through and, and, and minimizing. And it's like, well, he kept saying it was only going to be dancing in the room and that we just needed to get the little bit of money back for moving. And so you're like, all right, I'll, I'll just go in the room and dance tonight. I can trust him. You know, I, I, I wasn't a church girl. I got it. I was, 
you know, grabbing my friend's fake ID to go to the club in Vegas. I was like, you know, okay, I'll dance in the room. We'll get the money back and things will be better tomorrow. I can trust him. He loves me. So you just kind of justified. And when at first, when I had originally said no, that I didn't want to do it is the first time that he got physically abusive with me. And I can remember thinking, well, we're adults now, right? I'd watched my mom and in this violent relationship as a young girl. And I thought, well, maybe that's why I wasn't as shocked as someone who had never, who had, who had, I'd been desensitized to violence in the home from that. That was a vulnerability for me, for sure. Um, and I thought, well, we're adults now. And, and this, I've, this, I've seen adults fight like this. So I must be in domestic violence and it'll be better tomorrow when I have the money back. I'm just going to dance in the room and, and get back to my baby because I don't know my address by heart. I didn't write it down. I just need to get home where my daughter is. And it wasn't just dancing. And that night, it was the first time I was basically raped for money. And I can remember driving away from that house with him. He was driving. And I can remember thinking, how did this happen? Like, how did I get here? How did I get to this point where I crossed a line that I, I swore I would never cross? I was a good kid in school. I was never put in at risk category like how did I get here in this moment and just feeling suddenly very very broken and hopeless and um and I just thought that tomorrow would be better but it didn't and for nearly almost six years I was um bought and sold between three different traffickers uh, two men tattooed their names on my back like a piece of cattle so I could be returned to my owner I'd been hospitalized for dehydration and overexhaustion. I'd be given an hour to sleep in the closet. My face had been broken in five places. I was a beaten on a regular basis. Um, I'd have to tell my daughter I was in car accidents to explain the bruises. Um, I ended up getting strung out on drugs. By 21, I was a full-blown addict um, just to mask my emotions. and. And I can remember, try, I tried to kill myself twice. Uh, my mom had came and showed up in Vegas to take my daughter. She thought I was just a drug addict. And so she took my baby and, and went home. And at that point, I just tried killing myself. I just thought, God, if you're real, I don't, I don't want this. And I just didn't know how to get out of it. And a lot of people ask, why didn't you just run? Six years is a long time. You had a lot of open a, a physical opportunities to run. And a couple, couple things I always say. One is I did run, so I'm standing here. <laughs> I did run. Why didn't I run sooner? Um, I had multiple attempted escapes that didn't go as screenplays on Hollywood go. And you learn what to do with each attempt next time. Um, but the world just doesn't, the, your life doesn't always play out like the movies. Uh, you know, I have a, a trafficked friend who said that she kept thinking, at the next red light, I'm going to jump out of the car and every light turned green <laughs> and within three lights they were there and and so we we forget as healthy adult brains what someone who's 19 and and abused and not given food and given very little sleep and and living in fear we're thinking that their brain should be should be thinking healthy like ours and that's just not the case and we have to be a lot more gracious with people to say i couldn't imagine what my brain would do in a moment like that with fight, fight or flee, with flight, you know, fight or freeze, with the traumas that you experience, we all think, well, I just kick them and run. But your body actually goes into like a, a parasymptomatic response mode with neurology and trauma. And not everybody actually fights. Some people just literally freeze. And you're like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And then the scene has changed and you got to come up with a new plan. Mm. And so we have to be more, we have to be more gracious with people and less judgmental, and to know your life is different than mine. I couldn't imagine what that would be like, and I'm so sorry. And that's all you have to say. <laughs> I, I, I so get it, you know, I, and I've often, I'll jokingly say, you know, the church is the only place that shoots its own wounded, and we gotta not do that. And, you know, I so understand what you're saying because I remember in my own experience dealing with someone who was physically abusive, mentally abusive, uh, verbally abusive. I, I mean, I think the, I, I, I told someone once I would have rather gone through more physical abuse than verbal abuse because the way that I was spoken to on a daily basis all day was so below 
my ability today to comprehend how you could speak to any human being, even one that you hated in that way, you know, because it's, it's about breaking. It's about, re, you know, it's about keeping the spirit broken and, you know, dehydrating you, having you sleep in a, a closet, tattooing, you know, names on your back to brand you like cattle is all about the breaking of the human spirit. Yeah, and, and I remember, you know, I was that girl, like most people who would watch movies with women who were abused prior to my own experience. And I would say, what's wrong with her? Why doesn't she leave? I would leave, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then of course, then the, the, the heroine in the film, you know, she comes out fighting and all of a sudden she's free and you're going, yeah, yeah. And the, and the reality is that's not the reality. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember in the middle of my own testimony, saying many times, oh my gosh, I became that woman. I'm that woman that's in the movie I, I, that wants to leave, but you're stuck. You know, and, and, and when you describe that feeling of being stuck, I get it because in my sexual abuse, the way that I would deal with it was to lay there and I was paralyzed. I was paralyzed. I was a little girl, I was paralyzed. You know, and, and I think about how old I was, seven, eight, nine years old, but I was that same broken girl at 19. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm thinking about you at 19 years old with a child, with an infant in this experience. And, and while it's easy and, and I'm, I am an advocate and I stand with you in that, you know, we have to explain what it's like to others so they don't judge others. But in that moment, were you judging yourself? Were there moments where you were really condemning and judging yourself to this life that was literally thrust upon you? I mean, I, yeah, I think brainwashing is a very real thing. I think we all think in 2020, almost 2021, that we're smart enough to identify when someone's trying to brainwash us. But there's a, a new research report that had come out from the University of Northern Colorado that showed that domestic sex trafficking fits every indicator of cult behavior because there's a high control high control group leader that you're you know you're all of the things i mean it literally fit all i don't know 15 to 18 indicators of cult behavior and so in the middle of my shame my embarrassment my how could i how do i keep why do i keep giving in and yet i couldn't totally rationalize my my thoughts um, not just from lack of sleep and, and extreme abuse. Um, I can actually remember when you said that the breaking of the spirit, Cynthia, it, I can remember a time when my trafficker pulled me out in front of other girls that were, we, there was a, a home of us. So we called them our wife-in-laws. So pulled me out in front of the other wife-in-laws and beat me. I was beaten more than anybody. And I can remember him saying, um, this one has a spirit that won't be broken. And I used to be so embarrassed of that. I used to think, why can't I get it together like everybody else? Why can't I obey the rules like all the other girls? What's wrong with me? I was so embarrassed that I had this spirit that wouldn't be broken. And now I'm like, you're damn mad I had a spirit that won't be broken. That's the Holy Spirit in me protecting me, getting me through, not allowing you to have a foothold in who God wants me to be down the road. And now I'm so grateful and I... I was able to assist one of the other women in escaping and she's doing great things today. She actually just did a Ted talk. She, and so to have these, the two women that were in this home together, um, the feds finally raided our home in 06 and put him in prison for tax evasion. She, the girl I was um, assisted in, and it gets out today, her name's also Rebecca. And she ended up having to do a year in prison as well because the trafficker put everything in her social security number and she was too afraid to talk. And so they sentenced her to a year in prison for tax evasion and I ran. I grabbed my baby and ran. And I actually fled to the UK. I know there's wow. people here in the UK, lived in London for a year. Um, I lived in North Barnet, Hertfordshire, North Barnet, and um, started getting involved with a group called the Poppy Project, which helped me to see that I wasn't just in domestic violence, that force, fraud, and coercion is a form of human trafficking. Someone mm -hmm. is profiting off the cell of another human being for commercial sex. That is human trafficking. And so um, it really sought me on this journey to figure out why did God save me um, when I know other people that don't make it out of that kind of life. And prostitution is heavy, heavy statistics in homicide and suicide. And it's just not a safe um, 
it's not safe for, for anybody, that especially violence against women is really prominent in prostitution. So God came through. Yes. God, <laughs> he always does. God came, God came through and he always does. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop and end this week's session right here. But I, I really, I want you to tune in next week when we pick up with part two with Rebecca Bender, who is more than a survivor of sex trafficking. She's an overcomer and she's helping other women overcome. And this issue uh, is so important to me because as someone who understands the pain of, of sexual abuse in any of its forms, um, we got to do something. And, and we're in a, a time in the world where I do believe we can finally use our voices collectively and individually to do something. So you've been a part of this week's session. We'll be back um, with Rebecca Bender next week and we will pick up with her powerful testimony and this conversation looking at what's going on around the world right now. I'm Cynthia Garrett, I'll see you next week. And you were the God that said